Greg, I want to talk about eternal life because to me this is a critical part of making the decision about whether or not there's a God and whether or not this whole enterprise is, is worth anything. Mm -hmm. Sure. Eternal life is the goal. I want to know what that is. I would think the traditional heaven is pretty silly. Uh, yeah, some of the images of, uh, that you get of heaven uh, are uh, of places that um, I would think are better depictions of hell. I mean, sitting on a cloud with some harp, uh, you know, shooting arrows with naked babies, <laughs> something like that. And uh, uh, I always thought that the way heaven is portrayed is, it just strikes me as boring. And I experience boredom as pain. I don't know how, how it is with you, but if I'm bored, it's, in, it's pain. So it can't be that. Uh, the Bible says that the eyes never seen and the ears never heard and it's never entered into the imagination the things which God has in store for those who love him. So whatever we're going to say, we have to know that it's, it's, it's uh, uh, an, infin an infinite amount better than that. You know, that we're, if it seems too good to be true, that means you're going in the right direction. Um, now beyond that, I, I guess what, what I would say, Robert, is this. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of, of I imagine you have, but, but of, of intense beauty. Where you're listening to a symphony, or you're seeing a sunset, or maybe listening to a poem. Uh, it happens rarely, but it does happen. Where in that moment, you realize that you could never conceivably grow tired of this. Now the moments only last for a moment here. But I see heaven as being something like that. I, I, those... The experience of profound beauty, I believe, is like one of the greatest foretastes we can have of what heaven will be like, where the deepest longings of the heart will be met, uh, the, the dreams of the heart will be fulfilled, uh, the, the beauty uh, that we're capable of experiencing, we will be experiencing. Greg, but even the greatest moments of beauty, if you string it on too long, become cloying, like extra sweet chocolate. Mm. Yes, that's how we experience it now. But I'm not sure I agree that the greatest experiences of beauty are necessarily like that. Uh, it seems to me that there are moments that are experiences that are such that you know in that moment you could never get tired of this. Um, and uh, uh, that's what I'm talking That is, I think, a, a whiff of the eternal, a whiff of heaven. There is an experience like that. But having said that, if that experience, if it was nothing but that, if there was no variation in that, I mean, part of what makes beautiful music beautiful or beautiful art variation. is variation. And so I don't think heaven will ever be eternal sameness. I think it'll be a perfect version of what we have now. Um, not sitting in clouds with harps and, you know, naked babies, but, 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 but rather the, the perfect version of, of, of what's going on now. Uh, there'll be inner relationships. There'll be, uh, you know, so I assume, tasks that we do. I assume that we will be our individual personalities, because some religions would have the greatest uh, aspect of the afterlife being uh, merging into the right. cosmic consciousness and become part of God right, and right. lose your personality. Uh, okay. Now, I don't particularly want to lose my personality. Uh, yeah, there, there's a, a major difference uh, in, in a lot of Eastern monistic thought. You are the drop of water that goes into the ocean. Uh, whereas in the Judeo-Christian heritage, your individuality is eternal. Uh, there's, there's a part of you that, that makes you, you, distinct you. And the world is, and, the, and eternity will be more beautiful because of that. Uh, but in, still, even in some Christian thought, there is uh, the basking in the beatific vision of God. And you just sort of feel like you're, you're there as an individual, but then gradually losing yourself. And this is a progress, that you lose yourself and suddenly become just... Yeah. part of this beatific vision. There's, there have been, you know, Meister Eckhart and a few mystics like that in the church tradition who have used that kind of language that can lend itself sort of to pantheism. But I would argue that even with them, and they're, they're, this is like the most extreme case of, of the tradition, but even there, what they're talking about is, is like a mirror refracting the sun. Uh, that your total being is, a, is, a, uh, is defined by the love of God, and you have a unique way of refracting that love. So even there, you have your individuality, since that your individuality is no longer set over and against God, but rather is defined by its relationship with God. And this is really a, a, a core difference between uh, Christian thought and, say, uh, Eastern monistic thought, Hinduism and, and Buddhism. And that is that in Christian thought, well, in Eastern thought, oneness is the ideal. And so you become one with the whole. Whereas in Christian thought, love and beauty is the ultimate. 
And love and beauty require relationship, and relationships require individuality, which is why in the Christian tradition, uh, you don't lose your individuality. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, you'll know even as you are known. It'll be a perfect version of what we have now. Is there a spiritual analog of sex? Well, uh, I like what C.S. Lewis said about that when he talked about a little boy who first was asking his parents about sex while sucking on a lollipop and said, Mom, will I be able to have a lollipop when I'm having sex? And she said, no. So the boy said, well, then I don't ever want to have uh, a sex. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, there'll be something much greater than that, I think. Uh, it, sex is a foretaste of what is to come. Uh, but, but, but it's, though we have trouble conceiving of it, it now. But it's, a, <laughs> it, it's analogous. There'll be something that is analogous I to I think sex? the union, the union of two people uh, is, is part of God's goal for creation. Uh, being united with him, united with ourselves in harmony, and united with others in a way that reflects the beauty of, of God, I think that's the goal of the whole thing. And sex is one of the best ways, when it's done in the right context, is one of the best ways that we have of, of anticipating that. How about progress? Uh, we're all gonna be with God, and God is perfect, and does that mean that we're all stagnant, or, or is there something uh -huh, to do? Yeah. Is there something that we have to accomplish? Is there, is there more to learn? Is there more to travel? Sure. Uh, Gregory Nyssa was a uh, early church theologian, and he held the view, and I think this is beautiful, uh, that et heaven will be eternal progress. He, he uses kind of mathematical terminology to get this point across. He says it, takes, it will take an eternity for a finite point to ever traverse an infinite point. God is infinite, God, infinite in his wisdom and intelligence and beauty, and throughout all eternity, we who are finite will be uh, coming to an increasingly uh, deep and profound and enjoying understandings of him and of one another. And so we saw heaven as eternally educational. And I, I think there's something to that view. It would be boring if it was static. I think there'll always be things to learn, ways to grow, things to uh, improve, not necessarily in terms of our character or whatever, but in terms of just jobs to do in, in, in the world and, and things of that sort. So I think it'll be an eternal, eternally perfect a version of what we have here. What makes life interesting here is part of the adventure and part of the progress. And I don't think that will come to an end in heaven. So do you see the whole physical vast universe, maybe multi-universes, as part of the future of those who will be with God in heaven? Uh, yes, uh, the, the Bible, you know, the idea that heaven is this completely non-physical place comes out of Plato, not the Bible. The Bible talks about the redemption of the entire creation. Uh, the creation as it is right now is, uh, Paul says in Romans 8, under, uh, under siege. It's in bondage, it's decay, it's, it's corrupted, it's fallen, but it will be redeemed. And so um, uh, I see heaven as being a perfect version of what we have here, and that involves the physical creation, and I have no details about that, how exactly it will uh, look, but I believe that the, the whole creation will be involved. I love what, what C.S. Lewis does at, at, uh, um, in one of his works, I forget what it is now, but he has the three children they come back, I think it's to Narnia, and they recognize where they're at. It's their hometown, uh, but it's, it's, it's more beautiful. They see the colors more perfectly. They smell the smells more deeply. Everything has a richness it lacked before. And uh, that was C.S. Lewis's way of, of communicating that, that it's not that this present world is unreal, it's just not as real as heaven will be. And we'll experience the physical world. It won't be less physical than it is now. It'll be more physical. It'll be perfectly physical. So, so the heaven is physical or it's spiritual? Well, I, I, I'm not comfortable with that dichotomy. Uh, it, it will be the perfect version of, of the physical, spiritual world because uh, it involves both. But it won't be one at the expense of the other. It involves both. And it will be a, a progression. There'll be learning. There'll be activity. There'll be doing. Well, I, I know that whatever I think, it's much better than what I think. Okay? The Bible tells me that. And I, I don't can't know what think to of, think. I want, to, <laughs> I want to place the stars. I can't think of, of heaven being heaven unless there's progress, unless there's change, unless there's learning going on. So I, the, my conception of heaven involves all of those things. And I know that it's going to be better than that. How about our essential nature vis-a-vis -vis God? There's some who teach that when humans um, become saved, that they will become not only like God, but, but in essence, of the same essence that God is, mm. as, as our children are to us. Literally, we're the same. We're superior to them, but we're the same essence. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Well, it depends what's meant by the terms. Uh, you know, it says in the New Testament that, that we are made participants of the divine nature. So there's a sense in which we participate in, in, in God. 
And there's a long church tradition that has to do with our uh, uh, the deification, it's called, where, where we take on God's nature. But nowhere in the Christian tradition, Christian tradition do we ever become God. Uh, there's always the distinction between God and, and, and uh, his creatures. I think the way we participate in the divine nature, far from us sort of losing our individuality and being absorbed into him like a cosmic sponge, uh, we, we participate in the divine nature by participating in his love because God is love. Love's the defining characteristic of, of the creator. And so uh, heaven is a matter of us dancing with God, uh, dancing, participating in his perfect love, the love that we receive from him, we turn towards him, extend to ourselves, and extend to one another. That's really what the whole creation project is all about. But it's, it's more than when you say love, it, one can think of, of sort of a, a, a static situation. It just, but that could be very boring if, if all you're doing is sitting around loving. Yeah, I, 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 I don't see, well, whatever I mean by love, I don't mean that. <laughs> um, love, look at, love is, is like art. It can be expressed in, in an infinite number of ways. There's no one way of, being, of, of making a beautiful painting. There's always variations on it. So also, there's a trillion ways for me to love my wife and a trillion ways for me to love you. And, and heaven will be Hopefully about that's exploring. Hopefully different, different ways. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not going to love you the way I love my <laughs> wife. Uh, but you know, but it, it, love is creative, and it expresses itself in all these different ways. And so I don't think heaven will ever get boring, precisely because it will always be loving. It never gets boring. It will never be static. It will always be growing.